Welcome to another episode of the Victory Podcast. I'm your host, Keely Orr, joined by my co-host and former USC defender, Dion Bailey. Dion, so happy to see you once again. We are recording on a Monday. I think we all, as hosts of the Victory Pod, took turns. I delayed us last week. Cody delayed us last week. And now it was your turn, Dion. But we're here and recording, and that's what matters. How are you doing, Dion? Doing all right. Doing all right. Happy to be back for another uh, Victory victory uh recap so it's a it's a good monday so far yes you almost said victory sunday <laughs> it was close i almost did but you know <laughs> victory monday gotta Vic- get used to it right victory monday uh victory monday indeed and i'm glad our i think our listeners are glad to to see you slash hear you as well because as always we have a lot of defensive questions to get into and your wisdom <laughs> is always appreciated uh before we jump into it just want to give a couple reminders if you are enjoying the show please like wherever you like it wherever you get your podcasts or if you're listening on youtube on the simulcast uh please like and subscribe on the usc athletics channel uh, that's where you can find us um and then if you ever want to get your voice heard look out for a tweet or a question box on instagram our socials are victory pod usc and we put out uh usually a day before but we put out a tweet or question box uh, asking asking for any questions that you might have. So look out there for that. And I know I mentioned it before, but if you ever want to catch us on our normal schedule, Dion and I usually record on Sunday nights to give you an instant recap of what we saw on Saturday. And then Cody Kessler and I record on Wednesdays to preview the next matchup coming up for USC. And I'm excited about the next one, Dion, but we'll get to that when we get to that. (laughs) First, we got to talk about (laughs) USC, Arizona, uh, 43 to 41 triple overtime, Dion insane it's the first triple overtime win for usc in program history they lost i believe the three prior to that or two prior to that i'm I'm forgetting exactly how many they've been a part of at the moment but uh, a wild game on saturday were you able to to stay up and watch the full thing dion i did stay up and watch the full thing because uh i could not believe what was going on so i was glued (laughs) to my seat i had to see how it would finish up well, I want to pick your brain about it. And usually I ask you overall thoughts, but I don't even think we could probably start to summarize it without getting into a full podcast. So I'm just going to do this ad read at the top. Uh, performance is more exhilarating on a real road. Introducing the Audi Q5. Visit your SoCal Audi dealers, proud sponsors of the USC Trojans. And thanks to Ralph's at Ralph's. Everyone wins when it comes to saving big, because when you order online through the Ralph's app, you get the same great prices, deals and rewards on pickup or delivery that you do in store. So no matter, so no no matter how you shop, you always say big at Ralph's. Ralph's fresh for everyone. Fight on. All righty, Dion. Like we promised, let's dive into this game. It's so interesting. The Twitter discourse, you know, everyone <laughs> gets gets pretty feisty on Twitter. I was just curious from your own perspective. What did you think of this game? Yeah, it was a, a discouraging performance, I would say, Um more so from the defense end than the offense end. I mean, the offense has been lights out for, like we were speaking about before we started the podcast, for almost over a year now since the Oregon State game. So eventually they were going to either start off slow or finish slow, one or the other. So I wasn't too surprised that it took them, uh, you know, a couple drives to really get their footing going. Really, it took the defense to make a play for them to get going you know, feeding off off the defense that really lit the, the fire for the offense. So um, I wasn't too surprised by their slow start, but uh, for the defense to not come out and uh, take a step forward, that was discouraging. And that really was my take from the game. They had an opportunity to take a step forward coming off their performance last week, how they finished up at Colorado. And uh, I don't think they took a step forward. So that wasn't uh, what you, what me personally, what I expected to see on Saturday night. Like I mentioned, Dion, we have a ton of fan questions, so I'm just going to bring them up into the main portion of the pod as well. Just sprinkle it out, you know, throughout the course of the show. Sounds good. Sounds good. First one is from Sam, who says, Dion, is is poor tackling on players, coaches, or both? Obviously, coaches can't make the tackle for a player, but teams like Utah seem to have good tackling teams year after year. That makes it seem like at the root, it's down to coaching and how you practice. Would you say that's a fair assessment? Um, that can be fair, but then again, I mean, the coaches could be teaching – everything the right way and guys are just not executing whether they're not listening to what the coaches are teaching them or they're just not physically able to execute what the coaches are asking of them so I think it could either be on the player 
and on the coach, but my personal opinion, tackling is is majority on the player. Like, yeah, the coach can help you get better technique to where you can protect yourself or be a more efficient tackler, but just the simple act of tackling, that is all your mental makeup, just, just want to, wanting to get the guy down. So I think that's 98% in control of the player. So in that same vein, we got a question from Scott who said, Dion, is tackling an attitude issue, a want to or lack thereof issue, or just wrong techniques? I think it's a, it could be a little bit of both, but more so the the attitude and the want to. It has to be there. You have to want to go out there and be a tackling machine. And uh, that also shows in your pursuit as well. Like, if you're getting to the ball, you're not getting to the ball just to work up a sweat. You know, I'm getting to the ball because I'm trying to make a play. Like, yeah, I'm depending on my teammate to make the play that is coming his way, but I'm getting over there just in case he slips up, and then I'm going to have an opportunity to make another play. So it's a uh, it, – and when it's more of a just a, a effort thing, but it could be a technique thing, like guys not tackling the right way, like, hey – I'm going, I'm a little guy. I'm going to tackle a big guy and I'm taking him up high instead of tackling him down low. Or I, uh, I'm tackling the wrong way, leaving, leading with my head that it's a targeting issue or a safety issue. But that's really all the technique aspect of tackling. Other than that is just want to and pursuit. Like, to be honest with you, if you're getting six or seven hats to the ball, it doesn't really matter if you miss. Yeah. Because it's, two, three, four, five, six guys coming right behind me. And so that's when, I mean, if you see elite defenses, every, it's not just one man tackles every play. Like, but it's six, seven, eight guys getting to the ball. So if guys are missing, they're missing with the correct leverage. And guys who are in pursuit are pursuing in the correct angles and with the correct, with the appropriate effort. So they're, where they're supposed to be if a guy misses a play, they're right there to clean it up, and it's a minimum gain on top of, you know, whatever they had got before the initial contact. This is probably a dumb question, but what dictates whether or not uh, players are able to get there to have multiple hats on the ball? Like, I, I know at some point you have responsibilities, but is it just about play recognition at a certain, at a certain point? Uh, play recognition can help you get there faster, but... Yeah. It doesn't really matter just a ball going that way, put my foot in the ground, and I'm giving 110% to get over there. Like, I can't be saving anything for the next play. And that can a point to guys just not being in the right shape to be able to give the appropriate effort. That could be another thing where guys used to having less series because we've been doing a lot of rotating, and then guys were thrown out there for an increase uh count of reps yesterday and uh, and they played all the way to the end of the game because it was a game the whole way obviously so maybe they just got tired i'm not really sure but effort is all just a one two see ball get ball now of course there's always two ways of looking at things glass half full glass half empty uh, rama kind Definitely. of points to that he asked, is it a victory for the defense that after spotting Arizona a 17-point lead, they held them to 28 points uh, in regulation? And another point that we had from a, a listener was that uh, UW, also their defense gave up 24 points to Arizona. Now, of course, you know, you counting the overtimes and whatnot is different. But uh, to Rama's point, do you count that as a victory? Because I know that Lincoln Riley and especially Caleb Williams were very adamant that USC's defense and their efforts won them the game on Saturday. So can you look at it from that perspective? How do you view this, Dion? I can see that perspective, and I can agree with it to a certain degree because uh, at the end of the day, they did only give up 28 points, and they gave up 17 points in the first two quarters, so they only gave up 11 throughout the remainder of the game. And uh, two of those points from the, of the 11 was a two-point conversion. So they definitely, whatever adjustments they made, they worked. They were able to slow the offense down. But it, uh, to me, it, it wasn't about that. Like, it's not about the amount of points they gave up. Yeah, they only gave up 28 points, but they gave up, like, over 500 yards. So to be honest, it was Arizona left points out there. It wasn't like we were stopping them. They they missed the field goal, you know, some 
some weird play calls down at down. They get into the red zone just throughout the game, and uh, it it aided us. It helped us a lot on the defensive end. So, I mean, hey, you can look at it like glass half full. Because I mean, dwelling on it, especially from a coaching coach's perspective or as a player is not going to help them get ready for Notre Dame so yeah they only gave up 28 whereas they gave up 40 the week before so hey we improved on that uh bowing up when it came time to when they got in the red zone or just in crunch time when it was a uh, plays that were point swinging plays they were able to come through so I guess you can give them kudos for that definitely what in your opinion changed I guess at the start of in the second quarter because uh Riley mentioned how he thought that the defense was able to kind of settle in at that point and he also mentioned on Trojans live he was like a lot if you look back at the film some of the play calls that they had um on defense actually worked to what Arizona called it was just great plays made by Arizona I'm just curious from your perspective that evaluation of how um the defense was able to eventually settle in See, my thing was the whole game that's why I said it's not a it's not a schematic thing. It's not a Grinch thing. Like, guys are there to make the plays. They're just not making them. So, in the first half, it wasn't like guys weren't in position to make plays. They just didn't make the plays. And Arizona was capitalized on them. Missed tackles, turning into explosive plays. And that's really how they got off to their fast start. It wasn't like they were scheming us up and guys were just running free. You know? So, yeah. I and mean... Something we were talking about, and Cody and I call this the call this the pre pod before we pod, meaning the conversation you and I had pr prior to hitting record. Something yeah, I, yeah. I was asking you about before we hit record was uh, Arizona's first touchdown, where they actually did have a man running free, and they broke it down on the broadcast. So uh, they they did identify that it was Mason Cobb's responsibility. But in your opinion, Dion, how does something like that happen? Guys, just not either not seeing it well like is they're just too frantic in the moment not really uh seeing the formation that they're aligning against or guys not understanding their true responsibility when you when you know the foundation of a defense it does not matter what formation you line up against it can be a eye formation it can be a simple two by two which uh it can be 10 personnel it can be a two by two with 11 personnel meaning one back one tight end 10 personnel being one back no tight ends it can be a two by two 12 personnel two tight ends one back and obviously if you know the true fun foundation of the defense you will know how to align and how to adjust versus any of those formations and i don't think Really, anyone on the defense is to that level because uh, that play right there was just as simple. It was cover three, three by one, formation, two and three go vertical. That hook player right there, you know you got a wall three, meaning you take them vertical. And uh, and that specific play, Mason Cobb, he, he barely even looked at number three. Like he, It seemed like he was expecting Kalen to take him, and Kalen was expecting Mason to take him. So... Just simple miscommunications like that. You you hate to see that week six, like especially yeah. when we're we're through the tune up portion of our schedule and we're really about to to get into the meat of it. And you would hope that just the fundamentals we would we would have down to at this point. But from a defensive side, it seems that we're still not like really uh connecting all the dots really. So hopefully they can get in the film room and get things like that cleaned up. Yeah, as someone who's been in the locker room and been in their shoes, how do you improve in these things that you just identified midseason? Like game six, how do you head into game seven feeling more confident about what you can do on the field? To be honest, like it's funny because I've been at when we when I was at SC, my DC, my last year was Clancy Pendergrass, who was the NFL DC for the Cardinals when they lost to the Pittsburgh Steelers in the Super Bowl. So he had been, he had great success at the NFL level. And you go out there and you put some of the stuff that our guys are putting on tape right now. I remember in one meeting, he sat us down and pretty much told us like, you're not going to get me fired. Like, so he either, said that to you guys? yeah, like <laughs> he, he used to talk to us like we was in the NFL room. I loved it because it helped prepare you for the next level because College coaches, they really coddle players because, you know, the age range. Some of they are kids technically, but 
if you're trying to go get to the next level, he prepared us, whether it was watching tape, critiquing guys in front of everybody, you know, like everyone being on the same page, like not really cutting up the room to where the corner coach could be saying something that don't align with what the linebacker coach, when I say quarter coach, I mean DB coach could be telling his DB something in the DB room that doesn't align with the linebacker coaches, mm -hmm. with the linebacker coach telling this guy something that doesn't align with the D line is telling the D line. So everybody being coached in front of everybody and while, while we're watching game tape, like he calling out guys who aren't making plays, like being honest, what I'm getting to is you got to have a truth meeting pretty much where guys are being honest with it, with everybody. Like, you set an expectation. What do what do you want to do? You just want to be a college player? Do you want to play at the next level? Because what you're doing right now, either it will or won't help you get to to achieve those goals. Like those conversations need to be had, and guys need to realize that they're not uh, really holding up their end of the bargain. And you can't really turn the turn the the tide really mid season so to speak, without having some type of light bulb moment like that within the defensive, the entire defensive room or whatever you want to call it. Guys just got to realize, hey, we're not we're not understanding things. We're not giving the best effort. We're missing the tackles. So guys watching more tape, meeting together more, whether the coaches are there or not there, just taking that extra initiative off the field in the classroom to to help put it together on the grass. Riley also said on, on Trojans Live how, you know, internally in the locker room, there's this sense that they know they haven't put it all together yet and they haven't shown what they can do and that they've kind of put a chip on their shoulder in that sense. Does that like have you been in that situation from a, a player standpoint where you're motivated internally by what you've done or haven't done so far? Yeah, definitely. Like you understand uh, you're still finding a way to win games. And uh, you're not, you know, playing the playing the best in all three phases at once. So it's always encouraging when you, when you're able to win and, and you don't play well, you don't play a complete game. So I can definitely uh, see that playing a fact, playing a you know a part in how the coaches and the team are approaching this game. Because I mean, it is a conference game. Arizona typically does play us tough and. We went down, was able to fight back, and came out with a victory, and we really didn't play anywhere close to a, to our A game in any phase. So you could take that as encouraging. You know, gritty teams, championship teams, they find a way to win, even when they're not at their best or even close to their best. And we were able to do that. But it's not many teams left on the schedule that that can happen against. So that's why, you know, you got to be careful with how you approach it at this juncture in the season, like I could see if it was week three and we still had our previous three games we just played to go, you know, mm -hmm. where we can tune up and still really uh, fine tune ourselves to get ready for the meat of the season. But at this juncture, you would hope that we would be past that. And we really worried about getting guys healthy, like yeah. that type of preparation, just making sure we got all our best guys out there so we can put our best foot forward, not really not knowing who our best guys are. So that's a different thing. And speaking of getting healthy, um, I just thought it was, it was, it kind of flew under the radar, but it was a, a little dire for USC at the corner position as the night progressed. Because uh, first off, we didn't see Damani Jackson get into the game; he was not dressed out. And then we saw Jacoby Covington make that that interception that Riley credited with turning the game. But then uh, we didn't see him. Uh, towards the second half of the game he he came out at a certain point same with Christian Roland Wallace it looked like he got banged up a little bit during the game uh, we haven't gotten a, uh, a status update from Lincoln Riley yet uh, I'm sure we might be able to get that on Tuesday when he talks to uh, the media after practice and and sees how they play but uh, I thought that was pretty interesting seeing Prophet Brown as USC's corner in crunch time because he's a guy who I don't think even even registers on the two deep and so, uh, so some guys had to be put out there and, and trusted in crunch time so I just was curious you know what did you see from the corner play when when things kind of went awry there uh, it was tough because, I mean, our corners, uh, they really didn't have their way with Arizona the entire game. On the outside, Arizona was really able to make plays throughout the entire game. So I, I wouldn't say it was a big drop-off from the guys that was out there in the beginning of the game to the guys that were out there at the end of the game. 
it's just guys we we weren't winning our our matchups on the outside on Saturday. So to me, at a school like SC, it doesn't matter if it's one deep, two deep, or three deep. The way you recruit and prepare, I mean, you throw whoever out there, they should be able to compete at a high level. That's just my opinion of the SE that I've seen that I grew up watching. So he, I mean, 16 Brown, he, he went out there. I mean, he was, he was competing. He was battling. Obviously Arizona has two receivers who are uh, prolific guys that are going to play on Sunday. So it wasn't like we was playing against any slouches or anything. So, Hey, uh, he got thrown out there and uh, sometimes you got to get thrown in the fire and, uh, Find out what you got, and I think that they can be encouraged by what they saw. He never got down on himself, even when he didn't win uh, some opportunities he, he had, and uh, he was competing the entire time. So that's something you can be encouraged by, by a young DB getting out there. We got many questions about this topic, uh, but the one I'm going to choose is from Marcella, who said, who would you start at linebacker versus Notre Dame? So it was interesting just to see the the rotation uh, that we saw play out in game six. What are your thoughts, Dion? Me personally, I would put Shane Lee and uh, Rajon Davis out there simply for the fact that they are our best tackling linebackers to this point in the season based off what I've seen. And, uh, I mean, we're playing tackle football. I don't really care how fast you run or how big or strong you are. If you can't tackle, I mean – you got to get somebody out there that that can tackle more consistently because that's the name of the game in tackle football is to get guys down. So I figure if we put our best two tackling linebackers out there that our defense will be benefit from it, in my opinion. Dion, I know you have been following Tackett Curtis's maturation or his play so far through six games. We got a question from Kyle who followed up on what you uh, wanted to see from Tackett in after game one, which was just improvement each week. So he wanted to know what you've seen uh, through six games now. Uh, through six games, I haven't really seen him take that that mental leap forward to where he's, he's recognizing things post-snap or more so, more importantly, pre-snap. Uh, just different formations, uh, different alignments, uh, seeing things post snap. Guys, guards pulling, how his gap responsibility could change, taking the for the right uh, footing steps, like uh, versus pulling guard, going lateral first instead of downhill, things like that. I, I haven't seen him really take that next step on, but he's young. He's being thrown into the fire. He's getting the. A sufficient amount of, of reps it's not like he's out there for you know one series here then he's not out there for three four series and they throw him back out there so he's seeing a lot and uh being a lot is being thrown at him right now so i'm sure like once he's able to 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 truly slow the game down for himself then he'll be able to take that step mentally to where he can start you know, thinking about more things and not really worried about just I have this this gap versus run. I have this responsibility and pass. He could take it to the next step where he's looking for alignments, personnel, and things like that, so he can uh, put himself in a, in a better position to to make more plays. In that sense, we got a question from Scott who said, Dion, you talked in depth last week on the technique of reading pre-snap and post-snap responsibilities and the obvious lack of awareness that some players have. Question, when when did you learn all the small details of your position, high school, college, or pro? College, definitely. And what sped it up for me was I was a safety that got moved to linebacker, so I couldn't rely on my physical gifts because i was at that time like 5 11 190 pounds so what physical gifts did i have at the <laughs> linebacker position like i was at a disadvantage so i had to learn how to attack the offense like not how the offense was going to attack me but how i can attack the offense and put myself in the best position to make more plays because for myself, I always wanted to to make plays. I wasn't, you know, concerned about how I can take on a blocker. I'm thinking about how I can beat that blocker and still have a chance to make a play. You know, I don't want to just be take up a body for a body. You know, I got the B gap, so I just, hey, I, I'm getting blocked, but I'm in the B gap. Like, no, I want to get through the B gap and try and dip and get uh, horizontal and try and clip a leg and get in on a play or something like that. So 
for me, it started once I made that transition to linebacker and I really had to start uh, honing in on noticing if a guard is leaning or not. Like, is he getting ready to pull? So noticing or if the line, if the fullback, because back in my day, I mean, we played pro style offense like Stanford, even back Cal. Back, back, <laughs> back then, they had fullbacks. I know you guys don't hear that often, but... <laughs> So, like, what you guys will see is an offset tight end. Now I had to to understand when they're offset one way, if the back is to them, how does that affect how they react? Are they going to still cross behind the line, cross action, or are they going to just stay to the side that they are just so I could really put, you know, be a step ahead, like have a game plan, not always be reacting. Like, obviously, you can't learn everything, but – you can learn enough to where I, I used to take the field feeling like I wasn't reacting. Like I was, I had a plan and I was just looking for keys. Like, okay, mm. I see them align this way. I think this play is happening. So I'm going to believe what I've been preparing and I'm going to act, I'm going to react like that play is happening. Like I'm not going to wait for them to confirm that it's happening and then react to it. You know, like I'm going to attack the play. I assume is being ran based off my my film study and how I uh, try to attack the preparation and put myself in the best position. So that helped me. But guys that are, you know, play linebacker and not playing linebacker in college or DB in high school and playing it in college, they're still in that same mindset. They haven't been forced to make that transition to take that next step because they they really don't believe that that is the biggest difference from them being able to make a play because they still think, you know, obviously uh, four or five star athletes, they think they're most athletic or most gifted guy on the field at all times. So sometimes you got to get put in uncomfortable positions to to help push you forward mentally. So I benefited sense. from that. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Also about the, the character of the person and how you responded as well. Very true. Very true. Now, we have more questions about the defense, but I will save that for the actual uh, question segment. <laughs> I want okay. to jump into the offense. As you mentioned, Dion, uh, we were talking off offline, off off recording, about how this mm -hmm. is the first time we've actually had to like really analyze this this offense since Oregon State mm -hmm. because I think we've all come, uh, become accustomed to this offense just doing its thing. Caleb Williams having uh, an easy day for the most part, you know, but it seemed like on Saturday uh, it just was an uncharacteristic performance for Caleb. He wasn't uh, uh, getting it done through the air, but it, it you could still see the, the winner slash fighty, fighter spirit in him because he mm -hmm. still wanted to get it done and he did with his legs. Three rushing touchdowns on the night what did you see overall just from the offense why wasn't it working for usc on saturday uh, guys just weren't winning on the outside and we were depending on on uh, on throwing it a lot more so than running it in the beginning of the game so it, it seemed like oh we was really struggling but the main issue was we we didn't elongate any drives we didn't really get enough plays to give the offense Caleb enough a chance to catch their footing like mm. we went the first three drives three and out so after three drives they only got nine plays I mean that's not really enough to to have some success and uh you know really get going so I think that's why it took what it how long it took they just they needed more plays just needed to to see how Arizona was, was going to attack them. That's one thing you have to keep in mind, too, when you're uh, watching our offense and they start slow. Like, like people come out the woodworks with how to defend SC and Lincoln Riley. So yeah, it's kind of like a cat and mouse game in the beginning to really see how they're, they're going to attack us, how they're going to defend us. So we kind of need to get used to seeing not as fast of a start coming up playing against a more stout competition because it may be a different look coach Riley and them really having to fill it out how to attack like what we saw on Saturday the uh them having seven dbs on the field just you know playing Caleb differently and uh once they get it figured out obviously I mean you can't hold them down forever so it was good to see them respond the way that they did, even though it started off slow. Yeah, we actually got a question about that from Rama, who said, what did Dion think of Arizona using seven DBs in coverage? 
I think it's brilliant because as long as you got one of those guys to spy Caleb, because obviously if you got guys, we got we send in guys long and they're just dropping back and dropping back, then Caleb can run, scramble for ten yards, twelve yards, all the way down the field. But it's it's a unique unique way to defend Caleb. You're getting more athletic guys out there to whereas when he does run and whatnot, you got guys that can corral him. So I think it's something that we will see moving forward, guys that have the bodies to run a, a scheme like that where they may have some bigger safeties that can give you the DB feel athletically but physically still give you a linebacker-ish presence in the run fitting. So I, I thought they did uh, Coach Nance, who's an SC guy, if people don't know. Yeah, yeah. Coach Nance he, is an SC guy, so. Was he your time period, Dion? No, he was after me, but he oh, okay. was before me as well. I, if I'm not mistaken, Coach Nance was here when Pete was here. Really? Yeah, during Pete's time. And then he circled okay. back and came back during Nelton's time, Helton, Coach Helton's time. But he uh, then he was with Sark in Washington. You know, it's no fluke that he was with an SC guy in, in Washington. So he, he's an SC guy, so, I mean, I'm pretty sure he took it personal and really – they attacked us the same way they attacked UW's offense the week before, which, you know, we're past happy-ish offense. Not like we truly abandoned the run, but that's why I think that the 7-DB, 6-7-DB scheme is more successful against us than it could be against other offenses. What's the antidote to that? Is that just getting your running game going? Or how, how would you... You got to run it. You got to run them out yeah. of it. And you got to be able... The old line has to be able to get bodies on dbs and and really abuse them like they can't guys can't be losing those one-on-one -on -one blocking opportunities can't be getting beat by big safeties you know whether it's them beating them with their speed or actually like getting off the block of the line like that can't happen when we're playing against only three down linemen one true linebacker we got to be able to just run them out of that defense at that point whether we you know caleb only throws the ball 10 times in a whole half People got seven DBs out there. We should just continue to punish them, especially with a running back like Lloyd. Now, on Tuesdays, it alternates from, or excuse me, on Wednesdays, it alternates from what uh, offensive coach we hear from. Uh, last week was Dennis Simmons, so this week will be uh, offensive line coach Josh Henson. And I'm really curious his evaluation of the offensive line, just because we didn't see Michael Tarquin play in the second half. We saw Mason Murphy take over for him. I was just curious, Dion, uh, what was your perspective of how the offensive line played on Saturday? I thought they played well. I mean, the running backs, they had some holes. They weren't giant holes. So, I mean, I'm not an O-line expert, but I feel <laughs> like Caleb, Caleb had to, he wasn't, it didn't seem like he was being pressured like that. Like, yeah, he got hit a couple times, sometimes late, but it wasn't, it didn't seem like he was just dropped back and he only had two, three seconds. You know, he had a many of his, you know, pat the ball back there five, six seconds, couldn't find anybody and maybe uh, try and run and pick up something or throw it away type deal. So I didn't think the performance stuck out and it, like out of, or out of the ordinary from what I've seen the previous five weeks. I felt gotcha. like they, they had a, a pretty solid performance, gave Caleb, gave the running backs room, gave Caleb time. They, they definitely put forth an effort that should have given us the ability to produce more than 28 points in four quarters. Overall, what is your assessment of how the offense played in the sense of, I guess, concern meter, if you will? I feel like from my point of view, people are, are or were more concerned than I would have anticipated considering you have like in, in several categories, the number one offense in the country and like there will be off nights, you know, it, it, are you concerned at all from what you saw? Cause in my mind, I'm like, okay, well you have Lincoln Riley and you have Caleb Williams, like something's going to get like, it, you can yeah. bank on something getting figured out. Like I, to me, I'm not concerned when it comes to that. Yeah. Not concerned at all. Like don't last year we saw a even worse performance against Oregon. We couldn't do nothing against Oregon state next week. We back to scoring 40 every week after that. Like, I feel like, hey, eventually they're going to have a bad day. And if a bad day is 28 points and then getting up to 40 plus and, and triple overtime and getting a W, then I'll take that. So <laughs> I definitely would not be alarmed by the offense at all. I'm pretty sure they're going to come out on Saturday and look more like themselves. 
Makes sense. I agree. Alrighty, let's get into questions before we do. Just want to thank Audi. What if there is a portal to the future? Enter the fully electric Audi Q4 e-tron with an advanced touchscreen infotainment system. Audi, the future awaits. And you can take your health to the next level with Symbiotica. They're premium, easy to take supplements, fuel your body with key vitamins and minerals to help you reach peak performance on and off the field. Elevate your health today by going to Symbiotica.com and use code FIGHTON for 15% off site wide i'm going to start us with an offensive question since we were just there dion we had a question from jorge who said what is the what is preventing the offense from controlling the ball in the fourth quarter the offensive line or the play calling i think it's more so of play calling because we can really commit to running the ball and really uh turning on that four minute offensive mode coming from the sideline not giving caleb the option to audible out of plays or make certain adjustments really just hey it's a run and it's going to stay a run type deal so i think it's definitely more so of a play call thing or just caleb having a lot of freedom you know they give him a lot of freedom so he may see something and check out of a run to a certain pass like i'm pretty sure what you saw on that that goal line pass he, when him and rice disconnected I, i'm sure coach riley called a run and caleb yeah. checked to that throw he did, he did say that on Trojans Live on Monday. He said that was supposed to be a run. And he said that that's obviously just something that Caleb has to, to learn to have better awareness of mm -hmm. the whole context of the game. But he was like at the same time, and, and this is me reading the sub, subtext, but it was kind of like at the same time, Caleb is Caleb for a reason. And like that's if that's his Achilles heel trying to like win the game and put the game in his hands, then like it's kind of what you take at certain times. It's just something where mm -hmm. Caleb himself will learn eventually, you know, when is the place and when is the time? Definitely. So I, I don't ever see Coach Riley, like, taking that ability away from Caleb. So, yeah, I, I can sit here and say it's a, it's a play call thing, but it kind of works both hand-in-hand, -hand, you know, with the freedom that Caleb's given. He just has to be able to identify, to get the situation of the game, whether it's time or the down the distance and whatnot, and – uh make the, the the decision that puts the team in the best position. Daniel said, are we worried yet? Yes, USC is 6-0, and but the way we have won can't put a good feeling in anyone with the schedule USC has coming up. So kind of overall thoughts in that sense, Dion. It's really hard to judge because, I mean, I mean, two weeks ago, I thought Notre Dame was our biggest game. <laughs> now, going into the Notre Dame game, they, they have two losses, and people may be thinking Oregon's the biggest game now, like or UW is the biggest game down the line. So then you got to take it game by game, and the fact that we've been able to enter six contests and come out the winner six times, you can't take that for granted. There's definitely a skill in winning, no matter if you're playing inferior competition like uh, – or, or playing uh, teams that you're just expected to win against. So it's uh, it's definitely a skill and not something you want to take lightly. And uh, I, I wouldn't say that you take, you take anything from besides, like, mental errors or, you know, missing tackles, things like that. But performances, game to game, you don't roll them over. Like, just because they played this this week, they played how they played on Saturday versus Arizona. That has no effect on how they're going to play against Notre Dame because the matchup is completely different. The makeup yeah. of Notre Dame's team is completely different from the makeup of Colorado, makeup of Arizona. You know, they're built completely different. So guys are going to be asked to do completely different things. You know, they're going to be defending a completely different offense, a completely different philosophy. So you never know. We could match up better against a Notre Dame than we could against Arizona, even though people are just hearing the name Notre Dame, hearing the name Arizona, and thinking like, oh, like Notre Dame's going to be a tougher task. But yeah, you never really know that. You got to take it day, game by game. And going down the line, we could match up better against some of these teams that are considered tougher competition for us. So hopefully that is the case. And, and we're at our healthiest. Like, guys got to gotta remember this past couple of weeks, we did not have a uh, Zachariah Branch, who is mm -hmm. a game breaker, and I'm sure he would have made a difference. Believe me, <laughs> like <laughs> he would have made it. That slow start on offense we had would have been non-existent. I'm sure with Zachariah Branch on the field because he, like Caleb Williams, can make a play out of no play. So 
you just gotta you know have a full uh just take a full a full view of the whole picture and not just you know be nearsighted so i think i think a team they got a winning culture in the locker room and i think they if they're able to truly you know on to the next week i think this little stumble they had this week could benefit them going into a game playing against a feisty Notre Dame team out to to gain some respect you know so yep. i think this is a dangerous game in my opinion it could still be the biggest game obviously it's the biggest game on schedule because it's the next game so Good but uh, just the uh, if Notre Dame was coming into this game eight six and oh that's different than four and two like the mentality of the team is just completely different so I definitely think our boys need to hone the like, really hone in on on the uh, the preparation for this week because this Notre Dame team they're going to see on Saturday is not the same Notre Dame team they've seen the previous six weeks. Now, back to a comment you made about the culture. I thought it was interesting just hearing post game comments from. Riley and uh, just the players in general, they were, they were pointing to the culture in the locker room, just saying how, you know, if you aren't on the same page in the locker room, you don't come back from a 17 to uh, 17 and 0 deficit. I'm just curious from your point of view, Dion, what does that actually look like when you do believe in yourself in the locker room? Like, what does that actually look like that culture? Uh, No finger pointing guys just looking for, uh, solutions not uh reasons of why things are happening just trying to figure out how we can solve the problems that that we're that we're facing out there on the uh, in between the white lines and it doesn't hurt to have caleb williams like you know yeah. uh we cannot eliminate the fact that he almost single-handedly won the game for us so it's a. Uh, it's great that the locker room. It's not saying it's great that the locker room has the camaraderie and everything, but it's a lot easier to believe in and build when you have a guy like Caleb Williams. Guys truly believe they have a chance until those clocks re zero and they yeah. didn't come up with the win. They really think Caleb undoubtedly could find a way to to get them over the hump. So. That to me is the key to that locker room is they have that player. That 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 gives them that that super man feel that they really do feel like they could win every game because they have a player like him. So I'm not surprised that being down 17 nothing. Hey, you know, just shake it off. Hey, we give Caleb a couple opportunities. It's going to go the other way. So, I mean, I'm not surprised at all that that they're saying things like that because it's easy to to have that in a locker room with a guy like that leading the charge for sure. Now. Something that uh, Sean Cody said on Trojan's Live that I thought was interesting was that he said on the best teams he's been on, the teammates don't distinguish between offensive players and defensive players. I was just curious if you relate to that. And to those who are not watching, Dion is nodding right now. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It has to be a whole unit. Like It has to be a whole brotherhood. It can't be we have offense. And they have defense, and you got only defensive guys hanging out with defensive guys, offensive guys hanging out with offensive guys. Like, we all have to be one team. So, like, you know, for my me personally, say in 2011, offense come off on the field, and, you know, Marquise or Woody, they could ask me or TJ or anyone on the defense, like, hey, this guy, is he's playing me this way, like, how do you think I could have – how would you feel, like, uncomfortable of me attacking you if you was playing that way? Or, like, what are you seeing? Or how are they playing us? Because, obviously, they're out there playing. They can't really see – get a full picture, picture like we can from the sideline or, yeah. or how they're rotating or just anything. And if you don't have – you know, you're not working in – you don't have that cohesiveness within the entire team, everyone, you know, trying to help – uh to really accomplish that common goal of getting a W, then that's where you get the divisiveness when things get rocky. You know, like guys really not looking at guys as their teammate, like, oh, he's the only he plays running back. Like, I'm on defense. Like, he better go talk to his quarterback or to his receivers and whatnot. Like, so all the great teams are not like that. And uh even the team I was on in Seattle, people think like defense hated the offense, but like we hung out with Marshawn. Like, I seen them hang out with Marshawn. Like, they talked to Curtis, Doug Baldwin. Like, it was it, – it's never like – it can't be like that on good teams. So, yeah. 
Makes sense. I'm not and, surprised and, at all that a champion would be saying that about his teams. And, and the reason, right? The reason I bring that up is just because um, you could tell that Caleb was getting visibly upset when there were questions asked about the defense and post game because he was he was with uh, Lincoln Riley and Jamil Muhammad in the initial post game presser and. Lincoln Riley was asked about the defense and, and, and Riley had his answer. And before the next question could come in, uh, Caleb actually jumped in and said, you know, I actually want to say this too. And he was like, those are our brothers. Like he was like, they're the only reason we were in this game. And he was like, he kind he, he want, I could tell he wanted to say more, but he kind of reined himself in, but he, he, you could tell he was frustrated that the defense is getting as much heat as it is. So it's just that that's what prompted that, that conversation between me and Sean Cody. But um, I'm just curious, just from a player perspective, what prompts a guy to, you know, defend someone like that publicly? I, I guess that's a dumb question. I know, but it's just interesting to see. It's not Caleb. a dumb question at all. But it, it just, I feel it just, like it, it's interesting to see Caleb get uh, passionate in that sense. Well, he's in there with them every day. So he's really seen the work that they put in to try and, and get better from the defense that they were last year. So his appreciation for that that group of guys is a lot different than my appreciation for him or yours or just yeah. any outside eye. He really is seeing the whole – he's seeing all the, the work being put in and, and when it – for it not to go their way – you know, uh, the past two weeks, well, three weeks, if you include Arizona State, but, and, uh, you know, people that pretty much just disregard all the work that they've done to, because they are a better defense than they were last year. Let me state that. Like, yeah, without a doubt, they are better. Like, we're having some uh, some issues, but they're definitely better, and he wants to it to be known that they're, that they're putting in the work, and, uh, He's appreciative of the work that they're putting in to try and, you know, be a, a stout defense to give their team the best uh, chance to to run the table and accomplish their team goal. So I think that's where all the fire and the the anger, like he almost feels like they're disrespecting that that work yeah. that he's he's seeing because obviously we can't we not we're not seeing it. So yeah, that's that's what I feel like that's where it's coming from for him. No, yeah, no, that's good insight. I didn't even like fully think about that, but yeah, exactly. Like you, you see the 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 work, whereas we're just from the outside, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have one final question, and it comes from Alex. It's an interesting one, Dion. I will, Dion, I will admit. He said, Dion Keeley, after a game like this, besides having your own reaction to the game, you end up on the receiving end of fans' comments and overreactions. <laughs> How do you deal with it, and does it impact your day to day life? <laughs> Now, I, I feel like our answers are going to be different, Dion, solely because you are always are opinionated on Twitter. I can't, I just like, I can't handle being opinionated on Twitter. <laughs> I, I think just because like people will pick you apart about like the random word you choose or something. And I'm like, well, I didn't mean it like that, you know, so I can't, mm -hmm, I can't stay mm -hmm. opinionated, but you are opinionated. So I'm just curious your answer to this question. Uh, it doesn't affect my life, my day to day life at all. <laughs> Let me first say that. But I like to to put opinions and get a really dialogue started out there with the Trojan family because obviously, as a player, I never really had the freedom to really speak like that in the media. Mm. So uh, I try to use it to the best of my ability. Now, like you see things, <laughs> these are the same things I would be saying if I was on the team in the locker room. Like in my group chat with my Palace guys who played with me at USC, uh, the same stuff I like tweet out and whatnot. Like I would say to them first. Like obviously <laughs> I may say it in a different way, but like <laughs> it's a uh, it's a uh, pretty much the same way I would be in a locker room. It's just more uh, so towards the public. I'm in the, the Trojan family locker room, the fan <laughs> side locker room now. So just really uh, and trying to give the uh, the fans. Uh, the opinion of a former player because obviously someone who's never been in those players' shoes, their opinion or appreciation for what they're seeing would vary, obviously. So yeah, I just try to uh, be fair to the team and uh, also, you know, be honest with the with the fans because obviously if, if we're playing terrible and I, I go on Twitter, I come on here and like, oh, you know, everything's great. Like, hey, we're going to turn it around. <laughs> you know, just... Sounding real robot, real political, man. Nobody wants to hear that, and I don't feel like that's not that's you know, really uh being a being a disadvantage to 
play it being a disservice really yeah. to to the fan base so just trying to really uh close the gap really between uh, what's going on and how people are feeling in between the lines and, and how people are feeling in the stands so it's it's it's, it's fun to me to interact on the uh, social media See, this is something that Cody has mentioned before, and I haven't actually talked to you about it, but you mentioned it very casually. The palace. Can you please explain to people who don't understand or know the history of the palace? Oh, man. So uh, the palace, it was <laughs> me, Hayes Pillar, Xavier Grimble, Marquise Lee, Robert Woods, Silas Red. And uh, DJ Morgan, we all lived together in, in one seven bedroom house, <laughs> and uh, we uh, we had some parties that were pretty legendary, and that's how <laughs> we got the name the Palace. It was a big house, obviously seven bedrooms, and we were paying seven hundred dollars a room. And let me tell you, this is ten years ago. Well, yeah, over ten years ago. Is that good and or bad? I can't tell. I feel like. That was pretty high for back then. So we okay, was paying. Like, I was gonna say that seems kind of good. <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, it's it's what was it, six or seven bedrooms. Let's say it was six bedrooms. That's forty two hundred dollars a month. Like, how much was that property really costing? It was making a killing off of us. But Fair. Okay. We were having a great time, and uh, <laughs> that's really what it what it comes from is really just the parties and stuff we used to have. It's funny because we, <laughs> we would have parties. Matt Barkley would like he would come to the party. We tell him like, "Nah, Matt, you gotta go home because like we're all from L.A." So like <laughs> we <laughs> it's, it it wasn't like sorority parties and things like that we were having, you know. So it was it was it was very funny to see guys like Cody come through. Uh, Matt Barkley, but Cody, Cody, man, he for another story. Next week, I'll tell y'all <laughs> stories about Cody and, and his experience that even got him to commit to SC. I just tell you all you need to know about Cody. He's alluded but, to that story, but I don't know if we, it can ever make it on air. But <laughs> oh so. yeah, I don't. Yeah, true, true, it's true. An not, one. Now that I'm thinking, true. I don't know, but <laughs> I don't know. But. The interesting part though, did Barkley ever DJ at the Palace, or was that somewhere else? That was somewhere else. He probably okay. did that in the frat houses. We used to have, uh, we used to be in real tight with a pie guys, and they used to let us have parties at their houses too. Okay, their house too. This sounds but, uh, yeah. legendary. Yeah, yeah, it was it was good times, <laughs> and uh, that's where the palace name was uh, drummed up. <laughs> did you guys give it that name, or was it? Did someone else come up with that name? Somebody else came. We came uh, uh, into the locker room and people were just saying it like it was something like that we gave it. Like we called our house the palace. People just palace is palace. And we like, who is what are y'all talking about? Y'all like we, y'all in the palace. Like, I guess because back then all our best players, we was all living under one roof. And we was doing the partying and all that. So. So it, you were the cool uh, kids, was, basically. It was great. It was great times. Let me tell you, <laughs> great times, great memories, and I wish we could have passed it down to the next generation of Trojans, but we squandered that all. <laughs> well, it seemed fun. Uh, it was before my time, obviously, but uh, it seems like a fun time. But I'm an Orange County kid, and you prefaced that this was an L.A. thing, so I don't think I would be invited anyway, Dion, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we would have invited you. It would have been up to you to show up, but you definitely would have got invited. Okay. Everyone well, gets the invite. Okay. The, the palace is very uh, in, in, accepting, I guess. <laughs> yeah, very inclusive. Very inclusive. Okay, good, good. I'm glad. Alrighty, Dion. <laughs> now that we took that uh, side tour... <laughs> getting us back on track any final thoughts um i'm just curious what's your uh perspective of playing at south bend to me it's one of the best environments when it comes to college football i'm so excited to go there on saturday man um, oh my you're lucky but, that you get to take the trip too uh, for it's, sure it's it's lincoln riley's first time ever going to south bend um and i'm not surprised he said on 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 Trojan's life, he's glad that the he says it feels fitting that the first time he's going there is as a Trojan, which to me was one of those phrases where I'm like, oh my gosh, USC has Lincoln Riley as their head coach. Like it's one of those phrases where it kind of just puts you into like this is so surreal. Um, but yeah. your experiences with South Bend and and the rivalry that is Notre Dame USC. I mean, it's it's to be honest, it was the only game I was ever nervous in my college career. Like I'm talking, I had noodle legs out there the first snap, <laughs> legs really shaking. Like, oh it's, my gosh! If you're a, I'm a college football junkie. Like I'm a true college football fan, and that rivalry is just 
oozing of tradition and pedigree. Like so many great battles between our universities, so many trophies between our universities, national championships, guys being drafted, Hall of Famers, you know, guys in collegiate Hall of Fame, college Hall of Fame, pro Hall of Fame, high school Hall of Fame, it don't matter. Just like, just the names that come through that tradition to to be able to participate in it, it truly felt like an honor, and uh, I treated it that way. Like, especially going to South Bend, I mean, that experience there is obviously because we are we're at SC. I don't know how it would feel like if you know you was playing for a different school, sure. but coming going there in the South Bend as a Trojan man, there was no experience like it. No experience that for sure was 2011 and 2013. Two of my favorite games, like favorite experiences, man. And they're right up on you, too. They're right up on you, the fans on the yeah. sideline. So it's a, it's a great experience. They have a great fan base. And obviously, it's a rivalry. So they be juice when the children come to town, man. Yeah. I'm just I'm shaking out thinking about it. I'm excited <laughs> for the boys to get the experience that I know it's a lot of guys on the roster that have, that don't know anything really about yeah. this, this tradition, this rivalry. So it's going to be a... A great, great, great experience, especially for someone like Caleb. I know. And that just goes to your point about taking it game by game. Because, yes, obviously, there are improvements that need to be made. But, like, what happens when a Caleb Williams goes under the lights at South Bend? Like, do we see it a whole different level of Caleb, which is hard to even imagine? But, like... I don't know. I you don't know, know like... It's, the lights are going to be so much brighter, I'm telling you. Like, once you talk to these players after they play... In South Bend for the first time, you going they 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 should be telling you how much brighter the lights feel. Like it feels like a big game when you play in South Bend. Yeah, like yeah. it's just a different feeling. It's a great feeling. And, and the crazy part, I, what uh, weather have you played in? Because apparently it's supposed to be gross weather on Saturday. So wish me luck. <laughs> yeah, it's supposed to be raining. Really? Oh wow! Yeah, it yeah. was a uh, it was chilly nights, but we didn't have anything crazy mm. the two nights we played there. But like the two games we played there, it was the like the first night time they had played at night in like twenty or thirty years or something like that. Really? Or it may have been ever. Yeah, like in wow. two thousand eleven we went there. They played us at night when we upset them. And then in 2013, they ran it back and we played them at night again. And it was like the first time they had played at night since they played us in 2011. <laughs> so, like, that just shows you how special the tradition is that yeah. something as simple as just playing under the lights. They save to do against the Trojans, you know, Notre Dame. They, they choose their schedule, so they play a lot of blue yeah. blood programs and whatnot. But it's nothing like that tradition of... Of Notre Dame and SC uh, clashing, whether it's in the Coliseum or in South Bend. So I'm excited for the guys. And, and side note, I wonder if they're still at that hotel that smelled like chlorine. You've never <laughs> been to South Bend, right? I've never traveled with the team, but I to, so I have been to South Bend. I've just never traveled with the team, but I've heard infamous stories about the team hotel. So I feel like and it's the, something... The, I'm going to have to report that, I'm, back. I'm going to check in with you when you guys uh, travel because I want to know if they're still staying at that same hotel across the street from, it's a, like, what's that? It's a, a restaurant, it's milk something. I have no idea. It's Shake Milk or Milkshake or something. Oh, uh, Shake Shack? Not Shake Shack. Oh. Um, dang, I can't think of it, but <laughs> it's a shake place that's going to be right across the street. Okay. I guarantee they're in that same hotel because it ain't many places to stay on uh, <laughs> South Bend. And then it's going to smell like chlorine, apparently. Yes, it is. There's a pool in the middle of the hotel. It's going to smell and like chlorine like everywhere. And it just permeates through the rooms. Oh, my. It's, man, they, must, they got some strong chlorine in there, let <laughs> me tell you. Let me tell you. Interesting. Okay. I will report back on Sunday. Be sure to... I'll, I'll, I'm, I was going to say remind me, but I feel like if I'm in that environment, I'm not going to forget. So we'll see. Yeah, you won't. <laughs> okay. You will not. <laughs> Good to know. All righty, Dion. Any final thoughts before we wrap this one up? Nope. 6-0. and oh, Excited about the opportunity to see the guys go 7-0 and oh in South Bend. So everybody buckle up. Should be a good one on Saturday. Last win at South Bend was 2011, the game that you were in, Dion. So hopefully you can pass hey. on some of your, your your legacy to to the Trojans going out to South Bend this weekend. Hey, they, they need they need any a good juju that can reach out to any of us from the 2011 <laughs> team. You know, we'll give them that rah rah speech. <laughs> hey, you, you never know. We'll see. All righty, 
that's gonna wrap it up for this week's episode thank you so much dion uh we will be back like i said previewing the notre dame game with cody on wednesday so look out for that but that's gonna wrap it up for this week's episode that's dion i'm keely we'll see y'all next time